read something out of Isaiah chapter 6. Um, just came to me and I just want to read it. This is Isaiah chapter 6. I'm going to start in verse number 1. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, one, each one had six wings, and with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And I wonder this morning what a church service looks like if we just give it to the Holy Ghost. I don't know if you're new here or not, but I don't, I'm not going to apologize for the way we do church. Just not. You'll hear words, you'll hear tongues, but I challenge you to bring me scripture that says we shouldn't do that. But I wonder sometimes if we leave up our services to the Holy Ghost and if his robe would fill this temple and there'd be smoke and the uh, posts would be shaken, this foundation would be shaken, I wonder sometimes if we could handle it. But I'm just like Isaiah. Woe is me for I'm undone. And so this morning, I'm just going to ask you to hang with us. I'm going to ask you to hang with us for a little bit. We've got some some different voices that are going to be speaking this morning. And I just, I, I feel like there's an unction of the Holy Spirit. I felt it early this morning and I felt it before the service started and, but this morning we're going to before we go any further we're going to have uh, brother Josh and Janice Snader come up and uh, they're going to share a little bit with what's going on in their life and, and as they come up I'm just going to pray I'm going to pray Father I just pray this morning I pray Spirit of God that you would just uh, keep, keep our attention keep our focus on you and Father, I, I do desire, I desire actually that the foundation would be shaken. Maybe our foundation needs to be shaken a little bit, that we would get out of a normal, get out of a rut, do things the way that you want to. So Spirit of God, this morning, we just give you this service. We, we ask, oh Spirit, that you would move and keep moving amongst us and speak to us through different voices. And we just thank you, Father, for the sweet time of worship. May it be a sweet aroma to you and, and also the word that came, O oh God. May we set the table for you, Father, that you would have eminence in our life, that you would move, and that we, we would be moved by you. So, Spirit of God, this morning, we just give you this time. We praise you for it and honor you for it. In the name of Christ, amen. All right, Josh and Janice are up here. Thank you, worship team. And uh, we're going to give the microphone to Josh and Janice. And they are, we, we just uh, wanted them to come and speak to us. Come on up here. We wanted them to come up and share uh, with us what's going on in their life. Um, they are, and the reason we do that is because you as a church here at River of Life, uh, the money, the tithe money that, uh, that you give in uh, as obedience, I guess you could say, goes to support them. Uh, and help support them in what they are doing and what we feel that they are called to do and what they feel they are called to do and what the Lord is doing in their life. And, and I believe through this ministry and through the money that, that we uh, support them with, that lives will be brought into the kingdom. That's why we do it. If we didn't feel like lives are going to be um, uh, brought into the kingdom or lives are going to be changed, we wouldn't be supporting them. 
And so we just want to give them the time, Josh and Janice, I'm just going to pray with you. And Father, I just pray that you would uh, open, uh, loose the tongue of Josh and, and Janice, whoever's going to be speaking this morning. Just give them, uh, give them the words to say. And, and, and Father, open up our hearts and our minds to see what the Spirit of God is doing. We just thank you for the ministry that you placed upon their life and the call that you placed upon their life. And God, today we recognize that. And we just thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Josh, it is yours. Okay, is this working? All right. Okay, so I know that um, River of Life is, at least I thought River of Life was a pretty conservative church. So I was a, a bit surprised when I heard that your, one of your pastors and his wife became uh, homeless hippies and they're walking through the forest <laughs> looking for themselves. Uh, no, I, uh, we miss Rick and Sherry. I wish he could be here, uh, and just a plug for the home groups. We used to be part of one of, of, one of their home groups, and uh, it was really good, and we really missed it. So I give it a five out of five stars, and I would recommend it to a friend. So if you're thinking about doing that, it's a good idea. Um, so my name is Josh Snader, and this is most of my family. Uh, Elliot was uh, not feeling well, so he's with Grandma now. But uh, this is, uh, well, first of all, we used to attend here before we moved to Ohio, and uh, I'll get to that in a bit, but this is my wife Janice, um, and this is my daughter Addie, or Adeline, we just call her Addie for short, and she's, she is quite a chatterbox if you get to know her, but she's pretty shy initially. And um, Oliver's the one that's, or not Oliver, Elliot's the one that's not feeling well, and um, I would best describe him as a rocket without fins. It's kind of hard to point him in the right direction. But he's a lot of fun to have. And, uh, and then there's Oliver. He is seven months old. Addie's five. Elliot's three. And he's seven months old. And uh, so we're still getting to know him, but we like him pretty good. And we decide we're going to keep him, see how he turns out. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's, that's <clears> that. <throat> okay. So in June of 2019, we moved to a town called Coshocton, Ohio. And we began serving at an organization called MMS Aviation, or uh, Missionary Maintenance Services. Um, MMS fixes missionary airplanes from all over the world. They get shipped there in boxes sometimes on the back of U-Haul trucks. They fly them there. They, they come disassembled and broken, and we fix them up and send them back out into the field. Um, they do all that free of any labor charges. They don't charge any labor charges to the uh, mission groups. And that saves about one and a half million or more dollars to mission organizations every year. Um, even the staff, the CEO there, raise their own support so they can donate their time to the projects. Um, but they not only prepare planes for the mission field, but they also prepare people for the mission field. And um, I'll try to remember to hold this up here like that. Uh, so they have a 30-month long apprenticeship. Uh, that teaches people to serve as missionary airplane mechanics on the mission field. And that's what we were doing there for the last three years. Um, during my apprenticeship, I've worked on 20 different types of airframes, eight different engines. I put in about 5,000 maintenance hours affecting mission operations in nine different countries. Um, and then in April, I received my A&P license, which is kind of the minimum license you need to do basic uh, airplane maintenance unsupervised. So I'm still kind of shocked that they're letting me work in airplanes unsupervised, but uh, that's the blessing of passing the test, I guess. <clears throat> so River Life has been fa financially supporting our ministry there, and so I want to thank you guys and everyone individually who have been supporting us um, while we're there. It's been a real blessing. I've learned a lot, and now you might be asking what's next. Well, I'm glad you asked. So in December of 2021, we were accepted into an organization called Samaritan Aviation as an airplane mechanic family. Um, Samaritan Aviation flies amphibious Cessna 206s. So amphibious just means that they have floats so they can land on water, and they have wheels so they can land on uh, hard runways. So it's like a frog, right? They can go and land in water. It's amphibious. And... Uh, they fly them up and down the Sepik River in Papua New Guinea, or if you want to be cultured, you say Papua New Guinea, because that's how you're supposed to say it. 
and it's one of the least explored countries on Earth. Um, Papua New Guinea is an island. It's located right above Australia. It shares the island with Indonesia and has a population of about 8 million people. It really is a land of paradox. It's a land of opposites. It's a beautiful tropical paradise, and yet death is never far away. Um, there are no roads in the interior of the island. Disease and parasites are abundant because of the tropical atmosphere. Nationally, in PNG, one in 20 children don't live until their fifth birthday. And uh, in many remote villages, that uh, child mortality rate is as high as 40%. So four out of 10 children don't make it to their fifth birthday. And it's not unusual um, to find that parents don't actually name their children until they're older. And it's just a harsh reality. Um, it is also a particularly dangerous country for women. One and a half million people experience gender-based violence uh, in the country each year. And it's considered culturally acceptable to beat your wife. And it's estimated that every 30 seconds, a woman is a victim of domestic abuse. Um, it's just a real dark uh, island. So even though it's sunshine and beautiful and warm, there's just a real dark, a spiritual darkness there. Um, and the government uh, is opposed to this cultural tradition but they don't have the resources to adequately pursue each case that's filed. PNG also has one of the highest incidences of HIV and AIDS in the Pacific region. Um, it's a land of volcanoes, tsunamis, earthquakes. Um, the terrain is so rugged that uh, even tribes who have been living there for thousands of years have little contact with each other. In fact, tribes are so isolated that there are 862 separate living languages just in Papua New Guinea. Um, so Bible translation is a big work there. There's a lot of missionaries doing that there. Um, we'll have to learn a language called Tak Pisin, which is a trade language, commonly referred to as pidgin or Malaysian pidgin. Thankfully, they tell me it's pretty easy to learn. Of course, these people have never tried to teach me a foreign language before. So we'll see. We'll put that theory to the test. Uh, so this is the country where God has called us to go. And we'll be serving in the city of Wewak. It's on the northern coast. Wewak is home to the only hospital in an area the size of Mississippi. So you have an area the size of the state of Mississippi, and there's one hospital. And they call it a hospital. We would probably call it a clinic. Um, but it finds itself trying to serve a population of 300,000 to 400,000 people. And since there are no roads, people find their way to the hospital through jungle trails and rivers. It's a journey that can take up to five days in a canoe. So imagine that. You get appendicitis or something. You have to go sit in a canoe for five days and get your friend to row you, I guess. So you're probably not going to do much rowing yourself. Um, there's the main river in that region. is called the Sepik River. And it's about 700 miles long. It goes through the lowlands of the East Sepik province. And it is here that um, Samaritan Aviation has found an opportunity to share the love and joy of Jesus Christ in a very practical way. Since they fly airplanes that can land on water, that 700-mile river suddenly turns into a big runway. And this gives us the ability to pick up critically ill patients and um, fly them back to the airport where we transport them to the hospital. So it can be a five, four or five-day canoe trip. And yet the same trip in the airplane only takes about 45 minutes to an hour. So, you know, even around here, when, you have a, when you're really in trouble, you call the helicopter out and it can shave, what, an hour off your travel time to the hospital. Well, imagine what happens when you can shave off three days and 23 hours, you know, on your trip to the hospital. Um, if Samaritan Aviation isn't there, people are dying who otherwise would live. So um, I like the ministry. It's a very practical way um, to minister to people. Uh, the model for our ministry is laid out in Luke 10 in the parable of the Good Samaritan. And I'll just read a portion of that to you right now. <clears throat> but a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Jesus said, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. 
Jesus told him, go and do likewise. He went to him, bandaging his wounds and pouring on oil and wine. So Samaritan aviation is, literal, is a literal interpretation of the parable of the Good Samaritan. The organization is actually named after the parable. Um, we are called to be servants to the people the world is ignoring. So instead of walking by on the other side of the road, uh, we are engaging the dire medical and spiritual needs of their remote communities in the East Sepik province. We're going to them and we're bandaging their wounds with modern medical supplies. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. So Samaritan uh, Aviation offers free emergency medical evacuations. They don't charge the people anything for the flights. Um, in the PNG culture, there is no such thing as free. Culturally, you're always expected to give something back when someone gives you something or else you owe them a favor later. Um, it really makes people scratch their heads when we say we don't expect anything in return. Uh, you just saved their lives. You did the biggest favor for them ever, and you don't want anything in return. And it's like, that, that's not normal. Like, they start asking, why? Why are you here? Why do you do this? Um, it really opens the door into ministry. So instead of using a donkey, we're using a float plane, and instead of an inn, we're using a hospital. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. So Samaritan Aviation doesn't just save lives by flying people to the hospital, and then they don't just dump them there and say, well, good luck, and leave. They uh, have a hospital, a daily hospital uh, visitation ministry uh, where they reach souls. You know, they try to complete the, the um, ministry loop. They save their lives, and they try to reach their souls. And culturally, the hospital... Um, expects families, patients' families to provide clothing, uh, food, even blankets sometimes to the patients. But since the patients are so far away from their families, uh, that support system isn't there. And some of these patients have never seen cars or electricity before, and suddenly they're, you know, they wake up and they have IVs stuck in them, they have beeping equipment all around them, they have strange people from strange tribes they've never seen before, and they're just really in a vulnerable spot. And that's when we step in and provide all those basic needs, as well as biblically-based counseling, uh, a friendly face, and, of course, the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel, what I like about this is that the gospel is presented to the patients at a time in their life when they're most likely to receive it. You're, you're never quite thinking about eternity like when you had a near-death experience, right? Um, and Jesus said, go and do likewise. And so that's what we're doing. Uh, we are literally going and doing what the Good Samaritan did. We feel moved to go, not because everyone has to work on airplanes, not because everyone has to go to a foreign land, not because everyone has to be in, involved in medical missions, and not even because we're the best people for my job. In fact, that was one of my main arguments with God when all this started. It was like, why me? There's better people already know how to do all this stuff. Who would do a better job? Who would, you know, on and on and on. But I uh, kind of felt like Moses, and I thought, well... I don't want my annoying brother to come along, so I better just, uh, I better just go when he says go, right? Um, so that's why we're going, not because we're the best people or anything like that, but because we have the ability to make a difference and we feel responsible to do so. So I have a video uh, about five minutes long that kind of sums up what Samaritan does really well, and um, I think we're ready to watch it now.
In, uh, in April of last year, we got an opportunity to go to Zambia on a trip with a work team from MMS that uh, they went to fix some missionary planes there. And during this trip, Janice and I uh, had the opportunity to visit Mukungi Mission Hospital. Um, it was out in the bush of Africa. And that kind of uh, started this journey where we became convinced that God was leading us to be involved in medical uh, missions. I don't have any medical training whatsoever, so uh, you wouldn't want me doing medical work on you. But uh, I said, I, I can't fix people, but we can fix the airplanes that get the people to the hospital, right? So um, it just being moved by compassion to go to a foreign land so you can be 
a servant to people groups the world has forgotten and um, just miraculously touched their lives through modern medicine with no expectation of payment. Uh, so closely resembles the ministry of Jesus that I can't ignore it. And um, I think Jesus is a pretty good model to follow. So when you consider that uh, God brought us through the apprenticeship program at MMS, qualifying me to work on airplanes, uh, we just got through done with that. Uh, and then you combine the fact that Samaritan Aviation is a medically focused mission that uses airplanes and is at a point in its growth where they need more maintenance people. They have a real need for that. And, uh, and if you factor in there that my wife Janice uh, will have a chance to be used through the hospital visitation ministry to vulnerable hurting women, um, about 40% of the patients are pregnancy-related illnesses or conditions. Um, and I feel like my wife has a real gifting in that area. Uh, it's just like, well, Lord, send us. We'll go. I don't understand everything, but um, we're available, and we'll go. And that's why we joined Samaritan. Um, in the words of Mordecai in the story of Queen Esther, maybe God put us in this place for such a time as this. Um, so maybe this mission resonated with you and you want to get involved. Well, the best way to help us do this is to become a financial partner. Uh, we can't do this without people supporting us. And um, we, have, we, had, we have to raise more support from what we were at MMS because it's more expensive. Uh, but we have about another $1,000 in monthly support to raise. And we want to do that by July 23rd because we have a really busy summer. Uh, doing some more training and uh, cultural training and all that. Um, so that's one way you can get involved. That will be really helpful to our family. Um, we do have two large expenses on the horizon, which are our stateside training and our moving expenses. Um, in October, we're planning on going to this place called the Missionary Training Institute in Colorado. Um, it's a month-long training session where we will begin language study, culture study and we'll even do like preemptive marriage counseling because that's one of the main areas that uh, gets really stressed out when you're trying to transition to a culture that's like the polar opposite of what we're used to in almost every aspect. Um, so they'll help kind of prepare us for that. And they even have a daycare where they take care of the kids while we're doing that training and they teach them about transitioning to a new culture. And I didn't know you could teach children about that, but apparently they figured out a way to do it. And uh, I'm happy to let them do that. But uh, the entire focus is to prepare us and help establish us as long-term missionaries. Because long-term missionaries are more effective the longer you serve, the better you know the culture, the better you know the language. And um, our desire is to be effective. So we want to build that foundation for uh, long-term service. And then we also have uh, moving expenses. Flying a family of five to P&G is, isn't cheap. So we have that as well. Um, Please understand, we're not offended if you don't support us. Uh, but if God is prompting you to help us in our mission, we want to give you an opportunity to do that. Uh, we have a table at the back. We have prayer cards. Um, so we have a stack of them, and we want to give them away. So if you want one, you can pray for us. Uh, you can also sign up for our newsletter so you know how to pray for us as we uh, go about this. We're planning on moving to Papua New Guinea in January. We have, uh, yeah, a lot to do up till then, and I think January will work the best, so Lord willing, that's when we're planning on going. So thank you for having us and giving us your attention, and uh, really appreciate you guys' investment in what we've done. We couldn't have done this without people helping us. It truly isn't. I used to think that being a missionary, I wanted to be this uh, Indiana Jones missionary where I was single and I... I don't know, went and saved souls all by myself. And uh, God has been <laughs> teaching me that's not how it works. It's a team effort, and uh, I had a lot to learn. And he's been taking all of us through that. And um, so ready or not, I guess, here we go. Um. We're going to have the elders come forward, and Janice, if you want to come back up, we're just going to commission Josh and Janice to go, but you can come on down here, Josh. Yeah, we're just going to do it down here in the front, but I just, I, I just want to say 
Like a, a lot of times when, when we want to do mission work, we want a lot of recognition. We want a platform. A lot of us don't want to go into the mission field unless we have a platform, right? But I think this is what the church should look like is there's, there's a lot of moving parts behind the scenes that makes it all work. And uh, Josh and Janice are very content with being one of those moving parts in the back that make, make, make it work. And so we just want to bless you and uh, pray for you. I'm going to have Brother John Hooley come up. The microphone is on. And we're just going to commission them. If you would just stretch your hands this way. And we're going to pray over them and, and, uh, and tell them to go. Like the church of, uh, like, the, the, like the early church did. Thank so. you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. It seems good. For us and the Holy Ghost to release you. We don't only release you. We, we send our spirits with you. You aren't going alone. The Holy Ghost is going with you. He's speaking to you right now. In, in, in fact, I could just about tell you what he's telling you. <laughs> Fear not. Fear not, for behold... I will be with you, mm -hmm. even to the ends of the earth. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I will never leave you. My presence will always be with you. You may have to stop, take a breath, hold your heart, and wait for me. But I will always be there. I will always be your guide. I will always be your strength. I will always take care of you. As long as you walk with me, Thank you, Jesus. keep me as priority in your life. Lord Jesus, Combria oros ilion brandeo si ikilem brum bamala gundri ari kamasando gundri. For heaven I called you, I have called you both to walk with me in the presence even of your enemies. And I have prepared a table before you, and you shall walk and eat therein. Lord Jesus, I am imparting a new strength, a new anointing to learn what you need to do what I have called you to do in the name of Christ. We commission you as one of us. You are ours. You belong to Jesus. And we just walk in that fullness in the name of Christ. We release you with great joy, with great joy. And we will always bring you before the Father. We make that promise to you in the name of Christ. Amen. All right. Thank you, Josh, for sharing. I'm going to grab my Bible here. So this morning, I feel, I feel like the Lord is confirming some stuff. He's confirming some words. And if you just hang with us, if you can listen really fast, I can talk fast. Or I can slow down and you can take notes. Um, I just feel like God is confirming some stuff this morning. So kind of, uh, I got a word last Sunday morning that I felt was for the church. And then we had Brother Gil Michelle uh, last Sunday. Uh, a, a pastor, preacher, evangelist from South Bend that came and spoke to us. And, and then Brother John Hooley had a word. And I don't want to, I don't want to let the words that were released over River of Life, I don't, I don't want to let them fall to the wayside. I feel like they should be, should be expanded on a little bit. And um, so just asking God how to do that. And, and the word that I had before Brother Gil, Michelle even spoke, we're going to be in Acts chapter 8 this morning. If you want to find that, Acts chapter 8 is where we're going to be this morning. But uh, Kaimani had a, a Bible verse this morning that she was practicing for her river kids. And the Bible verse was Joshua 1 verse 9. Famous verse, Joshua 1, verse 9, and, and, and it says something like this, Be strong and be of good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And, and the crazy thing was, there's a, there's a room downstairs, and I'm just going to say this real quick. There's a room downstairs uh, that we're, we're kind of making a prayer room. 
And if you want to know more about it, you can ask Lamar Barkman or talk with me about it. But that, that room is open to pray in on Sunday mornings. Uh, the church unlocks at about 7.30. And if you feel the unction to pray for the service, to pray for the message, to pray for the worship team, to whatever you would like to pray for, that room is going to be open. But I went down there this morning to pray. And I sat on the rocking chair and I looked up and there's a plaque on the wall. Joshua 1.9. I, mean, I said, okay, Lord, you're trying to say something here. And then I go back and I, start, and I start thinking about the words that were released last Sunday out of Joshua. Where, Gil, where, where Brother Gill said that he said uh, he felt like the word was that you need to start sharpening the knives. Because there's going to be a fresh circumcision and, circumcision and you're going to have a fresh circumcision before you go into the promised land. And, and some, of these, uh, some of the words that he released, one was you're going into new territory. And that word was specific for river of life. You're going to go into new territory. You're going to take in some new territory. And then Brother John Hooley had a word after that. He said, sharpen the knives because there's going to be some cutting of the flesh. I can just tell you right now, if I understand circumcision correctly, it is nothing but painful. See, see, sometimes we, w we just want to get into the promised land without doing any of the legwork. We just want to get into the promised land without any of the hurt and the pain. We just want to get into the promised land where it's all nice and glorious. I can just tell you right now, going into new territory isn't always going to be nice and glorious and painless. But I do believe that Joshua 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 9 is for river of life today, and that is be strong and be of good courage. What it looks like walking into new territory, I do not know. But I do know that there's going to be probably going to be a little bit of pain involved. And I'll just say this much, and if Brother John Hooley wants to say more about it, he can, but I talked with him a little bit yesterday, and, he, and there's one detail that he let out and uh, left out in his word, but he's visual. John Hooley sees stuff, and, and, and when he released that word last Sunday morning, he said one thing that he did see is when that knife cut, there was a lot of blood. There's going to have to be some sacrifice to walk into new territory. I believe that. Um, I'm going to release this as well. Lamar, where's Lamar Barkman? There you are, right in front. Lamar and Sophie. I got a word for you this morning, and I, I, feel, I felt like this needs to be released corporately because it might be for some other people as well, but when I got the word, I saw you. So this is what the Lord showed me this morning. He showed me a big screen just like this. And you know, we come in here and it, it, it was one of those pull down screens where you pull down the screen and you turn on the projector. But, but what we do is every Sunday we come in here and we see the screen. We sing what's on the screen. We read what's on the screen. And, and, and it's almost, it's, it, I believe it's good. It's what we need to do during worship so people have the words. But, but what, what's happening to the church is that we're just doing whatever the screen says. But, I, but what I saw this morning, Lamar and Sophie, was that screen started getting rolled up. The screen is going up and there's going to be some fresh revelation. You're going to have a, a, a fresh view of what church should really be. You're going to have a fresh view of what God really wants to do. And it's because you're diligent in seeking him. And he will show you things to come. He will tell you things to come. And I believe, Lamar, that you can be a front runner. Because God is rolling up that screen because you want to know what's behind. And I believe God is faithful Amen. in his word. Amen. And I believe that might speak to some other people as well. Amen. Acts chapter 8. I'm going to get started on this message. Acts chapter 8. This was after Acts chapter 7. If you want to if you want to read a story about um, laying down your life for the gospel, go back and read Acts chapter 7 about Stephen and what happened there. Man, I, we, could, we could spend months in, in Acts, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing I'll be preaching out of Acts for a while 
when I speak. See, last, last, uh, the last time I spoke, I had a message all prepared. And then the, during worship service, the Lord kind of changed it. And I got up and he said, just go to Psalms chapter 43. And I didn't have any notes. And I thought, well, that worked out pretty well. So this week I thought, Lord, do I even need to study? <laughs> and it was almost like the Holy Ghost hit me over the head and said, don't get cocky. 2 Timothy chapter 2 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so, so I believe that that's where we need to be. We always need to be in the word. We always need to be studying to show ourselves approved. We always need to be rightly dividing the word of truth, truth because we never know when the Holy Ghost is going to use that. It wasn't like I had never read Psalms chapter 43 before. It wasn't like I had never, never thought about the altar of praise before. But when God brings that to you, you need to be ready. And so, so basically the Holy Ghost just kind of knocked me over the head and said, don't get cocky. You still have to rely on me. I'm just, I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm a very transparent guy, and I just kind of let you in on how this mind works sometimes. Is I hope that's okay. Some of you are probably going, you're weird. That's fine. That's fine. But uh, I want to re- start in Acts chapter 8, and if we have time today, and, and Brother Lynn, I'll just tell you now, if, if, if the word that gets released today goes with what you've been feeling, I want to give you opportunity. Okay. That makes sense? I want... I just want the Holy Spirit to have his way. Verse number one, so what happened was Stephen got stoned by a mob of people that that couldn't handle the truth. A mob of people that that were called out for what they had done to Jesus Christ. And and Stephen got stoned for what he believed. And he got stoned for truth that he spoke. But there was a young man by the name of Saul who was standing on the sidelines at that time. And he was watching what was going on with with his sect of people. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. We later uh, later read about how how Saul and Acts chapter 9 be a good message as well. We're going to stay in eight here. But how Saul was consenting unto the death of Stephen. He was, he was okay with what happened. He was basically on the sidelines cheering them on. And they threw their cloaks at his feet. And he kind of watched over their coats while they killed Stephen. But it says now Saul was consenting unto his death. They're talking about Stephen the martyr. Stephen was one of seven that got elected to be deacons. Basically, the, the, there was some dissension in the church, and, and the Hellenists came and said, our widows aren't getting the same treatment as, as your widows. And so, so the apostles said, hey, look, it, it, we don't have time. We have to be devoted to the word, so we're going we're gonna, to uh, anoint some deacons. We're going to appoint some deacons to take care of the widows and, and take care of some of the financial stuff. And that's, we still have that model in church. We have deacons that do that, but there's something required of deacons. And, and according to Scripture, and that is that they need to be full of the Holy Spirit and be men of God. It's not that they're not men of the word. It's not that, that they're not filled. I mean, these guys were evangelists. These deacons were evangelists, and we'll read a little bit about Philip here, but... Um, Stephen was appointed a deacon and killed soon after. But anyway, Saul was consenting unto his death. Now it says, at that time a great persecution rose against the church which was at Jerusalem and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. A great persecution rose against the church. See, there's there's a church nowadays. Uh, I don't know if we'll ever in our day see the physical persecution like they did back then. But I can tell you right now that the church is, is becoming more and more hated for the way that they believe or we're, we're, we're being seen as haters because of what we do not tolerate. Does that make sense? We are, all of a sudden, us Christians are becoming the haters because we don't want to tolerate uh, abortion or, or gay rights or, or, or gay marriage and all of that stuff, and we become the haters. It's not that we don't love the people, we just hate the sin because it's against God's word. It's an abomination to God, and, and, and I believe as a church what God hates, we should hate. I'm not talking about hating the people. I'm talking about if we're the church that stands by the word, we can still love the people, but man, we have to stand for truth. And all of a sudden, uh, and all of a sudden, I, I believe the persecution that is coming against us as the church is going to be that uh, we're going to be viewed as the haters. And, and they're going to try to shut down what the, the truth that we, we, we get to speak. They want to shut that down. 
and, and, and the persecution that arose back in this day, it was physical persecution, and it says that because of persecution, they were scattered. Yeah, I, I talked a little bit, uh, the last time I spoke, I talked about the church in Antioch, how, how the first church, uh, their, their, their mission was to send people, go, 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 to send people, and the church in Jerusalem, the Pharisees, was how many people can we keep contained? How many people can we keep here? But persecution, I believe, actually is vital for the growth of church. I'm going to say some hard things today. It might, be a, it, it might come across quick and hard, but, but just listen to me a little bit. Persecution, I believe, is vital for the growth of the church. Because it says when they were persecuted, they were scattered throughout all the regions. They were, it's, it's almost like they were thrown like seeds. And God uses this opportunity. He uses the dev devices, the, the, the evil that is coming against the church. He wants actually to use it to grow his church. And they were scattered. These, these, uh, it, it, these, um, the apostles stayed in Jerusalem, but these, de these deacons and, and the church was scattered throughout the region. And that scattered is almost like you're throwing seeds out so that they can grow. God is looking for opportunity to sow his seed. And what he does, he'll take persecution when the church is scattered. And he says, grow there, grow there, grow over there, and grow over here. Now, persecution, it's not right. But for the church, hear me out, it's not a bad thing. We get so comfortable we get so comfortable in sitting in our padded chairs every Sunday. It says that they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except for the apostles. And it says, Devout men carried Stephen to his burial and they made great lamentation over him. And as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Then it says, therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. And one of these was Philip. Philip was one of the deacons. He was one of the seven that was appointed. And they were scattered everywhere. And one of these was Philip. And it says, he went down to the city of Samaria and he preached Christ to them. Now, I'm going to skip some stuff. I want to, my message had actually started in, in, in verse 26. And so I, I'm not going to take the time to read everything. But if you want to read, uh, go back and read all of chapter 8 where Philip went. He started preaching and he did signs and miracles to the, to the people in Samaria. And there was one by the name of Simon the sorcerer. And Simon the sorcerer wanted the power that he saw was being displayed. And the apostles heard that, that, that there were signs and miracles happening down in there in, the, in Samaria. The crazy thing about all of this is that, that it says Peter and John, when they heard what was going on in Samaria, Peter and John went down there. And they laid hands on these people and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, if you go back to, I want to say it's in Luke. I might have it written down here somewhere. If you go back to Luke chapter 9. It was where James and John, uh, they walked into a city of Samaria and the city didn't really want to receive Jesus Christ. And he had his, it says he had his face set towards Jerusalem because he knew what was going to happen to him. He knew he had to give his life for, for the body of Christ. He knew he had to give his life for the world. And it says James and John realized that this city of Samaria, these people of Samaria didn't want to receive Jesus Christ. And so they said, hey, Jesus. Do you want us to call down fire from heaven and consume them just like Elijah did? That would kind of be cool if we had the power to call down fire from heaven. But James and John said, do you want us to call down fire and just, let's just wipe them out. They're not going to receive you anyway. And then Jesus told them, he said, you don't know what spirit you are of. He said, for the son of man did not come to destroy lives. I didn't come to destroy any life. I came to save souls. That was the city of Samaria. John was one that went down there to lay hands on these Samarians so that they could receive the Holy Ghost. Cool story. Sometimes the people that I want to call fire down on are probably the very ones that I'm called to go save. Not me. Not me save them, but go share the gospel with them. And so they were the ones that went down there and then Simon the sorcerer saw what was going on. He said, hey, uh, how much money would it cost me to get this? He said, he actually said, I want the power. That power is exousia, which is the authority. He said, how much will it cost me so that I can get the authority that you have by baptizing people in the Holy Ghost? 
Peter said, your money's going to perish with you. You've, you've, got the, you've got it all wrong. And uh, what I want to say is that it's not that, we, it's not that I have the authority to just go lay hands on anybody that I want to, that they receive the Holy Ghost, or lay hands on anybody that I want to and they get healed, but I can guarantee you one thing, I can introduce you to the authority yeah. that can do that. And, and so, so we're going to get past Simon the sorcerer. He wanted the power and all of that. But um, I'm, going to get to, I'm going to get to verse 26. This is really where my message had started. And I just want to bring some stuff out uh, about, what, about new territory, circumcision, um, and, and, and the word that Brother Gill kind of released over this church. Uh, he, said, he, said, he said a few things. He said, new territory. I wrote it down here in my Bible. He talked about circumcision. He talked about fresh foreskin. And, and he also talked about there's something kind of boiling underneath, ready, ready, to, ready to burst through, ready for breakthrough. And then he said something like this. He said, it's going to look different. It'll look different. This new territory is going to look different from what you're in. Remember, remember that as we go here. Now, an angel of the Lord, this is, this, is, uh, this is in Acts chapter 8 and verse 26. It says, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south to the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And it says that this is desert. This is desert. Now, my message this morning, when I got the message last Sunday morning, uh, it, it, it was, I, I always name it something. It was oasis in the desert is what I came up with, or hope in the desert. But the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, and he said, get up, and I want you to go to the desert. Get up, I want you to go to, to, to Papua New Guinea. Get up, I want you to go to the desert. Get up, I want you to go to the wilderness. Get up, I want you, go, you to go to Africa. I want you to go uh, to Indiana, to another county. Get up and go. But what we so often do is, is, is Philip didn't ask too many questions. But I can tell you right now, I ask a lot of questions. I probably ask a few too many questions because when, when the angel of the Lord would hit me on the side and says, it's time for you to go to the desert, I would probably say, but but can I not just invite them to uh, the air-conditioned church over there on the corner right beside the little nice little ice cream shop? We could go get some ice cream. Uh, we could refresh them first. We could take them into that air-conditioned building, and the preacher can speak to them, and maybe they'll get saved. That's how we want to do it. That's how we want to do church. That's, we're okay with listening to the Holy Ghost unless he tells us to do something that doesn't quite fit our lifestyle. We're okay with listening to the Holy Ghost unless he tells us to go to the desert, unless he tells us to do something that is a little bit of out of our comfort zone. I'll never forget, I've shared this before, but I'll never forget one, one morning I pulled out of our lane ready to go to church and I, 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 that morning I just a feeling like, uh, God, I'll be your John the Baptist. I'll go to the wilderness. I'll preach the word. I'll be that John the Baptist. And he kind of just said, hey, you want to preach to a thousand you got to preach to one at work first. They know me too good at work. I can't preach to them at work. They know who I am. I want to go to preach and preach to a bunch of people that don't know who I am. But Philip had to learn how to be obedient. He was, he was one that was persecuted. He was sent over to this, this region of Samaria. And then when he was there, he was preaching to people, and people were getting saved. And God said, Philip, I want you to go to the desert. And, and what we want to do oftentimes is it, it, it looks so, it looks so uh, how, how do I want to say? What we're doing is good. That's what Philip could have thought. He said, man, people are getting healed here. People are receiving the Holy Ghost. And, and even the Simon the Sorcerer, I think, is coming to Christ. God, what's wrong with what I'm doing here? But I want to tell you, I want to tell you the desert, there are people, and, and this may, th there's a couple of sides to the coin here. You might be being called to the desert, but you might be driving through the desert as well. I can tell you I've walked through the desert. I don't blame the devil for it. I don't blame God for it. I blame myself for putting myself into the desert. I blame myself for walking through the desert. The desert is a lonely place. It is a dry place. There is nowhere to hide in the desert. But I want to bring something out this morning. 
when I'll get to that later. But when you're in the desert and you're looking for an oasis, you might be the one that God sends to help somebody out. Amen. Amen. But if you, keep, if you keep pushing through the desert, I'll, I'll tell you, it, it would be so easy to stop in the desert and give up. And I blame myself because what happens is life will grab, you, you try to grab life by the horns, but that horn will just gore you up the side and say, no, nope. It'll, the desert will chew you up, it'll spit you out, and it'll leave you to die. It is a dry, lonely place. What happens in the desert, <clears throat> what happens in the desert is, okay, here we go. What happens in the desert is, is there's a, there's something called a mirage. How many of you know what a mirage is? A marriage is, is, it can happen in the desert or it can happen when you're out on the water, but it's almost like a hallucination. And what happens when you're going through the desert, it's a dry, lonely, dusty place, you're thirsty, and what happens is there's something, a marriage is something that pops up on the horizon and it looks promising. It'll, it'll, it's like a picture, you'll see all of a sudden in the, I've never experienced this, this is from reading books and from research, but a marriage is, is an illusion is what it is. And you can be going through the desert, you can, you can be going through a dry, lonely, thirsty place, and it's destitute, and all of a sudden this marriage will pop up, and you go, there's water. And you start going for water, and the closer you get to the water, the further off it comes. And what happens to us, even with, with, with the government that we have right now, please... Please understand me, I am grateful to live in the nation that I live. I'm thankful every day for the freedom that we have, but I can tell you that evil is rising. And, and, and what happens oftentimes is we have this false hope set in front of us, almost like it's a marriage and we're going, there's hope in front of us. And the closer we get to the hope, the closer we get to this promise, it keeps moving further and further away and all of a sudden it disappears and we're going, where do I go now? There's an oasis in the desert. And when Philip decided, when Philip was called to go to the desert, I just want you to know this, and, and, and we can speak this to Josh and Janice as well, but, but it's not up to you to find the water in the desert necessarily. It's up to you to go. When God calls you, I can guarantee you he will provide the water. He'll provide the oasis. And sometimes this desert gets so lonely and dry and destitute, and, and we start seeing mirages. You'll see the same thing if you're if if, I, I, if people are stranded out on the water and out on the, on a boat for days, they'll start seeing illusions. They'll start uh, their mind will will actually show them things that are not there. And so so this is Philip. He didn't ask a lot of questions. It says that he arose and he went. He went to the desert, and behold, a man of Ethiopia. See, this was new territory for Philip. Philip had to lay some things down. This was new territory. He was stepping into something he had probably never experienced before, and it was desert. And it says that he arose and he went. Behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch. Now, I don't know how many of you know what a eunuch is. I'm not going in detail. Uh, look it up. A man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning. And what, what, what happened to me when I was walking through the desert, and I can tell you it was pretty recent, when I'm walking through the desert, it, it, you come into church, you come into the worship place, you put on a facade, everything looks good, you're dressed to the nines, you got your family with you, uh, and you walk in there, you can put on this facade, and people don't really know where you're at. But if they really knew what I was going through, they would have known that I was going through a desert. I was going through a dry and thirsty land. I would come to a place of worship and I would leave this place and I'd drive right back into the desert. And this Ethiopian had just come from Jerusalem. He had just, thank you, Drew. Amen, brother. I like when my brother Drew gives me amens. Appreciate that, young man. He was dry, and he had just come from his place of worship, entered right back into the desert, and he was driving along, and there's something that this Ethiopian did, this, this eunuch did. It says that he, was, he had come to Jerusalem to worship. He was returning, and he was sitting in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. The best thing that I can tell you is when you're going through the desert, you don't stop. When you're going through the desert, you read the word. 
When you're going through a dry and thirsty land, when it seems like you're not getting any revelation, when it seems like the Holy Ghost is far from you, when it seems like God has dropped you, I can tell you one thing. You pick up your Bible and you read. You keep pushing through because God is going to provide you an oasis. God is going to honor what you are doing. God is, even though sometimes your heart isn't in it, sometimes your mind isn't in it, sometimes life has just grabbed you and thrown you to the wayside. We could go and we could read the parable of the sower and all of that, how the seed can't grow because of, because of the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches will come in and they'll just choke out the word and that's what happens in our life often is where family and friends have maybe left us or dropped us or family and friends don't agree with what you're doing and the deceitfulness of riches where next year I'm going to make enough money to get me out of this hole and next year I'm going to do this and procrastination comes and sets in and all of a sudden the word gets choked out but I can tell you one thing to do you pick it up and you keep reading I don't care if you're going through the desert you keep pushing because God is faithful and he will send a Philip to you if you're going through the desert and I want you to hear something. God just may use you to be that Philip for somebody who's going through the desert. Amen. And, this, and this eunuch was on his chariot. He was on his cart, rolling through the desert, reading the prophet Isaiah. And God says, I'll, I'll honor that. I'll honor that. And here's what he did. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake the chariot. Are you kidding me? In the desert, on a cart, God says, I'll honor, I'll honor your diligence. I'll honor that you're studying the word. Amen. So Philip ran to him and he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. And here's what Philip said. Do you understand what you are reading? Folks, I, I just want, I want to be careful, but I'd rather have a church full of, not full, but I'd rather have a church of 15 people who are built up in the word, full of the Holy Ghost, doing the things of the kingdom, than 1,500 who are coming together Sundays to play Kumbaya and driving back into the desert. That's where I'm at. I, I'm done with religion. I'm done with normal church. If that's not you, I'm sorry. We need to be, we need to know the word and we need to be ready to teach. If we know the word and if we are ready to teach, we can go into the desert, we can jump up on the cart, we can go out wherever God calls us and at a moment's notice we can tell them this is the word, this is the truth. And this is what the eunuch said. He says, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him in the place in the scripture, scripture which he read was this. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a lamb before his shear is silent. So he opened not his mouth. And in his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? Who will declare his generation we want to walk into new territory. We want to walk. We want, we want these words that have been given the river of life. We want them to be fulfilled. Correct. We have to be willing to walk into the desert. We have to be, walk, be willing to climb up on the chariot, chariot with the eunuch in the dry and thirsty and destitute place. And we have to be willing to be the one who will spread the gospel for Jesus Christ. See, you see, Philip was, Philip was an evangelist, and he was called, he was actually later in Scripture. This is not Philip the Apostle. Please don't get him mixed up. Philip the Apostle was one. There was also Philip the deacon, Philip the evangelist. We read a little bit later how he had daughters that would prophesy. But he was an evangelist, and he was one. An evangelist is not somebody that just gets up in front of a bunch of people and preaches. An evangelist is not just somebody that who's looking for a platform so that he he can speak to a bunch of people. It's somebody who has a heart for the gospel. It's somebody who knows the word of Jesus Christ. And it's someone who just speaks out the good news. That's an evangelist. An evangelist is always ready to, to speak of the good news. And that's what Philip was. He was an evangelist. He spoke the good news and he had one man driving through the desert that he was called to. He didn't ask very many questions. He just said, God, I'll go. We have to be willing to walk into new territory. Amen. 
We have to be built up in the word, ready to teach. We have to be willing to ask them, do you actually understand what you are reading? Because many don't. So the eunuch answered Philip, and he said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. You see, we can, what we do is, uh, uh, Christians, we're fickle people. <laughs> we're very fickle. Like, we get offended when somebody doesn't quite agree with our theology, we get offended when somebody doesn't quite agree with the way that we believe. We get offended pretty easily. Like there are people out there in the world that are callous and hard and it's hard to get to their heart. They don't get offended nearly as easily as we do. Like we walk into church and somebody doesn't say good morning or somebody doesn't shake our hand. We all of a sudden think that they don't like us and they're offended by something we say. And we go back and we try to, try to see what I said or did that would tick them off. And then it's just this whole vicious cycle. Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. There's so many arguments about how we should do church, what we should do in church. I hear stuff. <laughs> I hear stuff about river of life. Um, it's among a certain culture. I'm going, where in the world did you get that? But something that is uh, good fodder, I guess you could say, or uh, it's gossip and it travels like wildfire. And people, people like to justify the way they do things by looking at other people and thinking they're wrong. That's what we do. That was free. I'm not going to charge anything for that. Um, I want to finish up here. Um, now, as they went down to the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, said, see, here is water, what hinders me from being baptized. And, and here's what I want to say. You go into new territory. You get called to the desert. Our new, the new territory, it might not be what you thought it would look like. It probably won't be what I, what I think it should look like. But new territory is, uh, I, I believe we have to keep an open mindset and, do, uh, and, and be very attentive to what the Spirit of God is saying. You see, we have, we have our view of how it should go, but I was talking to my sister Gloria yesterday, and I'm going, uh, what if people would go to a greenhouse to get healed? I'm not just there to buy flowers. I'm also there to hear the gospel. We have, this, we have this thing of how people should receive the gospel and how people should come to Christ. And when the eunuch, eunuch looked at Philip, he goes, you mean that's it right there? That's the gospel? That's, that's how I can be saved? Philip, you preach to me. This is, if this is the truth, then what in the world is hindering me from getting baptized? There's water right here. We just came to this oasis in the desert. And there's water right here. If you can justify to me, if you can show me scripture that somebody needs to take a whole bunch of instruction classes before they can get baptized, I want you to show me. Because it is on the profession of your faith that you will get baptized. And when, when, the, when Peter gets up on the day of Pentecost and people say, you're just drunk, you're full of new wine, you're speaking in other tongues, and he says, ha, no, it's, it's early in the morning. We don't drink that early. Us Christians, we wait till later in the evening. <laughs> and Peter starts preaching to them. It says that they were cut to the heart and they said, what do we have to do? And he said, just repent and confess your sins to God and be baptized. Well, there's only 3,000 that came. I don't know how many instruction classes they had from about 9 o'clock in the morning until they had 3,000 baptized. There was one instruction that was that you confess Jesus Christ with your mouth, you can be baptized. You believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And here's a eunuch in the desert on a cart, and Jesus, and Jesus has preached to him, and he goes, well, here's an oasis right here in the desert. We just came to some water. I can tell you right now, if you're called to go, God's going to provide you the water. Amen. He, will, he will have an oasis ready for you whenever you need it. Now, sometimes I'm going, God, I need the water a little bit earlier than that. 
He says, no, I'm always on time. And so one man on a cart, driving through the desert, reading the prophet Isaiah, not understanding what he's reading, and God shows up. But he used another man. Used another man. There are people that try to justify not being an evangelist. There are people that are trying to justify not spreading the gospel because uh, every man is, is, is drawn by God. Who is God? Who's Jesus on the earth? Who's the Holy Ghost? I don't want to sound conceited, but I'm like Paul. I believe I have the Holy Spirit. That's not, that's not being conceited. Paul said it. Paul wrote most of the Bible. He said, I do, I too believe. I think you should listen to me because I believe I have the Holy Ghost. If I say something that does not resonate with your spirit, that is fine. You can fly red flags. Please understand, I do the same thing. It doesn't matter to me who's preaching, who's teaching. If I get a red flag, if I get a check in my spirit, I will always compare it with Scripture. We need to do that. But it is a simple gospel that can be shared on the cart in the desert. And the eunuch says, here is water. What is keeping me from being baptized? I, I'm telling you, I think it's time that we view, that we rethink a little bit how we do church. Then yeah. Philip said, with, if you believe with all your heart, you may and he answered this, and he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He commanded the chariot to stand still. Both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water. It doesn't say how much water, but they went down into the water. I don't know. We'll leave that. And he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water... The Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Hallelujah. But Philip was found in Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Philip was called the new territory for one man. He didn't hesitate. He didn't argue. He didn't say, uh, I... I I had that argument sometimes where I'm going, I'll, I'll never forget. I probably shared this before, but we had an opportunity. Uh, it was pretty much an all expense paid trip because I wouldn't have picked to go to Las Vegas, but we were uh, said, hey, you can go to Las Vegas. There's a house there. You can go to the house free of charge. Uh, that was the only thing that was free of charge, by the way, food and gambling. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> was expensive. We'll have an altar call later. But, at that time, I decided that I'm going to Las Vegas, but I'm going to go with a purpose. And so I took some Bibles, and I took some, some wristbands, and I took some cards, and I took them with me. And we went to Las Vegas, and I thought, oh, I'll change this city. <laughs> no, I didn't see it. And I, I'll, I won't, I'll never forget this. We were at a Goodwill because the ladies thought, if you're in Las Vegas, there's a lot of rich people here, and their Goodwills are good. Is that true? Yeah, yeah they were good. And it, it costs extra luggage to get it back home, but it was good. So we were at this Goodwill, and I was sitting outside, and I thought, okay, where do I start? I got to share the gospel. I got to, I got to, this was new territory for me, trust me. And uh, I thought, hey, God will show me somebody to share the gospel with. And there was people all over the place. There was a bus stop right over here. There was a couple of people in there at the bus stop, and, and I was, and I was like, no, probably not him. And I said, God, show me you got to show me. I got to be really certain that uh, the right person. And then God, like I said, like I, I call it, I've said it before and I've used it today, but he hits me over the head. I call it the two by four anointing where he takes a two by four and he smacks me over the head. And, and it's the very thing that I felt like, like I need to say this morning when, when God called Philip, he said, it doesn't matter who I tell you to, to go share the gospel with. You need to be instant, in season and out of season, and be ready to share the word. You see, what, what he, when he says, be ready, be instant, in season and out of season, in season and out of season, you're going, what, what season are you talking about? Because this was in the summer, and I think winter would be better. 
Because we could, people don't have as much to do and they could come to church and all of that. But when he says in season and out of season, you know what that means? He says you be ready to share the word when the opportunity presents itself and when it doesn't. Yeah. How's that? Be ready to share the word even when you don't have opportunity. And so, and so I was waiting for this sign. I was waiting for a pink elephant and, and, and a guy on a tricycle and everything. And, and then God said, preach the word. And you'd be ready in season and out of season. So I said, oh, well, okay. So I went over to that bus stop and, and I, I walk up this man and I'm like, where do I start? Uh, I said, sir, how do you do today? And he didn't want to give me the time of day. And I said, um, can I pray for you? No. Uh, do you know Jesus? No, never heard of him. I said, really? I mean, can I tell you about him? No. Can I give you a Bible? And re you could read about this Jesus. He said, no. And I walked away. I said, boy, boy, God, that was, that was a waste of my time and probably a waste of yours and probably a waste of that guy's. But what God spoke to me at that moment was, I just asked you to be ready when the opportunity presents itself and when it doesn't present itself, you be ready. And you can get rejected two times and five times and ten times, but I'm telling you, you need to be ready for number 11. Because you never know when God is going to hit you on the side and say, I need you to go to new territory. I need you to walk, and it's going to look different from whatever ever you've imagined. I want you to go to the desert. There's a man on a cart being pulled by horses. And there's probably flies all over the place and and it's just, it's hot out there and it's dry and lonely and destitute. But I want you to go because that's number 11 and a life is going to change. And so this morning what I, I hope this all makes sense and the words that we have is had last Sunday was new territory and, and circumcision. Cutting off old flesh and exposing new and different. It's going to look different. I don't, I don't know. I wish I could tell you. I wish I could tell you what different looks like. <laughs> I have what, you know, I can, I can kind of come up with what I think it should look like. Almost certain that's not what God is thinking. And so I want to give opportunity. I'm going to have the worship team come up and Brother Lynn, I'm going to leave that up to you. If you feel like that resonates, yes, it does. So as Brother Lynn shares, he had a word this morning. As Brother Lynn shares, we're going to have the worship team come up. I... Uh... Ten days ago, I had a headache, migraine headache. It was so bad I had to go to the ER. I felt like it was going to rip my head off. I've never had such pain. Some say it's a demon. I, th I say it's my brain. I've had migraines. I don't give the devil that kind of credit over me. While I was in the midst of that, and you know what a 10 is for pain, a gal came in to take care of me, a nice black lady. And I looked at her and I see God on you. I feel him in your hands. And she started to weep. I was in the midst of pain. I couldn't help myself. Love. Love for the people around you. Love for each other. I have a word for you brothers in leadership prophet, pastor, pastor, elder, elder. Know that God knows you. Know that he's here. He appreciates your concern and your love for his sheep. He will spur them. He's told me, we don't have the luxury to let our leaders carry this load. It is too much. It is too much for any one man. It is too much 
for our elders and our pastors in and of themselves without our help daily. The Lord spoke to me about this. I was up through steroid buzz. I've been on steroids for three days and haven't slept but maybe two out of those two hours. But I've been spending time with him and I've been in his word. And he says every man is going to be judged by the works of his body. That begins right here, brethren. That begins right here where the rubber meets the road. We can wake up and honor God by speaking to the lost, carrying the burden for these men in prayer. And I mean daily. You get an unction to go visit, go visit. You get an unction to go feed, go feed. You get an unction to pray and lay hands, do it. You get an unction to cast out a devil, do it. Walk out this faith that he has given us. I've looked at this verse for many years, and I'm going to share it. It's a little bit, but I'm going to share it because now is the time. This is in John 14, and I've studied this past this word for a long time, and this particular question never made a lot of sense to me until very recently. Verse 21, 14, He who hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Manifest is metamorpho. He, spiritual God, morphous into the physical in his Son who sent his Spirit to us. Do you believe that? Do you believe you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, surrounded and in you? Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, the traitor, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? That question bugged me for a long time because I didn't know what manifest was. I didn't know. I thought this verse was speaking about God being in me and I'm just going to be doing all kinds of things. And I end up in the ER with a splitting headache, and I speak Jesus to her. I'm telling you, that's coming. I drive a school bus, and I got little girls who want to come up and get baptized, and I don't preach anything, particularly because there's a lot of Amish on that bus. And they, their kids, I got thank you cards from Amish moms and dads for the love I showed them and for blessing their children with safety. Don't tell me that's not an avenue. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Practical Christianity, the average Christian. And I make no, make no apology for my passion or my steroids here. If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our bow with him. He that loveth me, not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things I have spoken to you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Last verse, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, never let it, neither let it be afraid. The gist of that is in the midst of my turmoil, I had peace. In the midst of my pain, I had peace. Supernatural peace. I was out walking my dogs praising the Lord, thanking him for patient pastors, thanking him for a patient church. And I was full of joy. And then the devil came with condemnation, and he said, what are you doing? Don't you know there's chaos out here? 
Don't you know there's people miserable out here? Why are you so happy? What do you have to give them? And I thought about that and prayed about that. And I told him to leave. But I couldn't help but think about that because he had a point. What's my right to be joyful and, and at peace in such a dark place? This is my right. He has given me that. It's supernatural. We all have it. And we all have a responsibility to walk it out. That's exactly what the word said to me. Pastor Gill said it quite well. Can I pray? Good Father, we thank you. I thank you for the patient brethren here, Lord God, that love me and let me speak the words that you gave me. I know that things are changing here, Lord God, and you're changing each one of us. Have your way, Father, in the name of Jesus. Protect our leaders here, Lord God. Build them up in the name of Jesus and help us, each one of us, build each other up in these times, oh God, in the name of Jesus. Amen. I also feel like uh, if you're in a desert season, that if you're going through the desert, that God wants to put a spring of life. He wants to spring put a spring of living water in that desert for you. That even in the midst of the desert, you have that hope that when you go through, you can be a hope to other people. And I know that he has not called us to fear, but he has called us to love those around us. And that's who he declares that we are. He says that we, you know, he is risen and that same power lives in us. I just want to encourage you that that power still resides in you, even if you feel like you're dead and dry. Because, you know, in, in the word it says that when I'm weak, he is strong. And just want to encourage you to depend on him. Depend on him for your anointing. Depend on him for what he's going to do through you. And so just put your faith in him. Trust him. Because he's going to lead you through. And you're going to come out a better person. And I also believe it was it Paul that said... Paul are one of the one of the people in the Bible that talk about how they go through hard stuff just so they can help other people through it. And so you might not understand what you're going through. You might not understand why you're going through it. And like Jerry said, it wasn't because he would necessarily did something wrong or the devil is inside him or any of that. It's because God wants to put something in you for other people, for the people around you. He wants to build character. And that's what comes out of the desert. And it's so amazing and so rewarding. So, love you guys. All right, thank you. We're going to close with a song. I, I want to thank you for your patience. I never know how it's going to go. I was going to be done before now. But um, just thank you for your patience this morning. I, I do feel, uh, Sam, I, I was going to touch on that. There was another word that was brought Release River of Life last Sunday. That was there's something going on underneath. There's a churning going on underneath, and it's about ready to burst. Is that is that kind of what was said? And I, I just feel like that is as River of Life, we we can be an oasis in the desert. We have we have these. There's something bubbling up underneath, but when it bursts, when it finally bursts through, it will water and bring vegetation. And oasis in the desert is actually. It means it's a place of water and vegetation where something can grow. Most places in the desert, uh, stuff will not grow because of the, because of the, uh, the lack of water and, and just the, the sunshine that burns it up. So this morning, this morning I, we, I, I do want to open the altar as we sing this song. Please, if you have to leave, please go. Please do it quietly so that if people are at the altar. But I do feel like the, the, to put a call out there, if you feel like you're going through the desert, if you feel like it's been dry and lonely for a while, I can tell you right now that ministry is lonely. I wish I could, I wish I could tell you different. At times, it is a lonely, lonely place. Because there's a lot, there, people might not understand you. People might not think the way you do. But, but not just that. Or if you're, if, if, if you're going through life and it feels dry and lonely and destitute and, 
and you're just looking for water, looking for an oasis, we want to pray with you. We want to stand with you. And then also, just like Philip, if you just want to be commissioned to go to the desert, this new territory might scare us a little bit. Um, but Joshua 1.9, remember that. I feel like that verse was for us today. Joshua 1.9, write it on your hand, write it on your wall, write it on your mirror. So as we sing the song, if we could, just let's just dim the lights. And, and uh, if you want prayer, please come forward. Or if you just want to uh, come um, to the altar, please do that. We're going to sing this song and then close. And if you have to leave, please, uh, we're not offended if you do. So. We're going to sing a song where in the first verse it says, This is my prayer in the desert when all that's within me feels dry. This is my prayer and my hunger and need. My God is the God who provides. And then the chorus is where I want to get to. And I, But I will bring praise. I will bring praise. No weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice. I will declare that God is my victory and he is here. Let's sing that together. And the altar is wide open if someone wants to come up.